Hello and welcome back to the Waterstones podcast. I'm Will Rycroft and in this episode, after the COVID pandemic put the chance to bring authors and readers together on hold, we're going to celebrate the return of in-person events and challenge the assertion that you should never meet your heroes. To begin with, I popped down to the Cheltenham Literature Festival and parked myself in their writer's room to find out from the authors there how it felt to be able to connect with readers once more and to ask if they had ever had any encounters with their heroes in the past. So I'm in the writer's room tent at Cheltenham and I've managed to corner uh, crime writer and recent Knight of the Realm, Ian Rankin. Ian, it's lovely to see you. Thank you very much. Nice to be here. Um, you are a, obviously very experienced uh, attendee of uh, literature festivals like this. How has your Cheltenham experience so far this year? It's been great. I mean, you know, we've been through the mangle a bit. Um, writers and readers with literary festivals having to go online and, or just disappear for a few years. So to actually come back to a physical festival in front of a live audience is great. It's never the same when you do it via Zoom or whatever, you know. Or when we were coming out of lockdown and you could only have so many people in the room, you lost a bit of atmosphere. So to be in a big room full of people, you get the, you start to get the vibe from them and that sort of G's you up and you give a better talk as a result. I yeah, think. yeah, yeah. I mean, I was... You, you're quite prolific on Twitter, and whenever I see you, you you do always seem to be out and about. Oh well, you're only catching me at certain times. Then <laughs> I mean, I know because really, as a writer, I spend most of my year not going anywhere. Right. I mean, you know, when I'm writing the books, I don't go anywhere except maybe down to the pub. I mean, I do wander around Edinburgh a lot. It's true, and I do take photographs to try and persuade people to come and see us in Edinburgh because we need all the tours we can get. Um, but yeah, when I go on tour, of course, suddenly you think, oh, he's always he's always gallivanting, always gallivanting. You think, no, that's for like two months of the year you're gallivanting. And it's nice to be gallivanting when you've had two years of them doing none. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I suppose this return to literature festivals, and as you say, that, that connection with readers is so important, isn't it? What, what do you find people want to talk to you about when they do get to meet you at these festivals? Well, you know, you get the Rebus diehard fans, fans of my character, and they want to know what he's up to, is he going to die, how's his health, how's his dog. They don't want to know about me, they don't want to know about my health, I could be I could be on my last legs. They wouldn't bother as long as there's another Rebus book in the works. So there's a lot of that. Um, of course, they're talking about, you, you, can, you know, you talk about big moral issues in crime fiction, and often they want to talk about the state of the world and politics. And then people just say things like, oh, I went to Edinburgh, I went to the Oxford bar where Rebus drinks, I loved it, but how come you weren't there? <laughs> They're quite a demanding bunch, your fans. Quite a demanding bunch. Quite a dem but if, if I am there uh, in the Oxford bar and they do come and they do find me, they often buy me a drink. So that is the recompense. And with Rebus, I think there, there are different types of writers, who some who want to do something different with every book and others who are, are able to return to a character. What is it for you that keeps bringing you back to Rebus? I think several things. I mean, one, he's a great character and I enjoy spending time with him. Number two, as a detective, he's a very good way of investigating the world. So I can talk about any issues I want to via him. He can investigate society from top to bottom. Um, so that's very useful to me because that's the kind of books I want to write. I decided to age him more or less in real time. So when I come back to write a new book, he's a different character from the character I was writing about two years ago. His life has moved on. I mean, for example, now he's retired, no longer a detective but still feels like a detective. So he's trying to elbow his way into investigations, but he's finding it harder as he gets older. He's got health issues, which he didn't have a few years ago. He's no longer the big, roughy tufty macho guy that he was in the early books, so he's got to use his wit and wiles to try and get the results that he used to get by being physical and intimidating. Mm. So he keeps changing, he keeps evolving, and I age with him. So he's dealing with some of the stuff that I'm going to be dealing with in a few years' time. So if he's got COPD now, for example, so he can't climb stairs. So he had to sell his flat, because his flat was on the second floor, mm. moving to a ground floor flat. And a number of times it finds will come up and say oh I've been dealing with something similar or my parents have been dealing with something similar and it just makes him feel real to them. Mm. You mentioned there as well that of course writing over a period of time you see the world changing. It, it feels as though the pace of change is getting faster and faster. Does it feel like that to you? Yeah it does and I mean one of the one of the pains of writing detective fiction is that you've got to keep up with the technology. Mm. And the technology involved in investigating the crime is changing all the time. And so how do you, you know, you need to find that stuff out because you better believe your readers will know about it. So DNA analysis of a crime scene, um, what happens at a post-mortem examination, that's all changed. And we can now get evidence that wasn't possible to get five years ago, even two or three years ago. Um, a cold case, a body that's been in the ground for a long time, you can get a lot more information from it 
different than used to be the case. Then you've got people's mobile phones, you can get information from them in a way you couldn't, etc, uh, etc. Et so I've got to keep, keep up with all of that. And you're right, the world is changing at an exhausting rate and a confusing rate. And I think one of the things people like about crime fiction is it does give a sense of that there's a resolution. Mm. There, there, is, there are answers to our questions. And if you stick around crime fiction, your questions will be answered and the world will start to make some kind of sense. And at the moment, it doesn't. At the moment, we seem to be in this kind of chaos, chaotic jumble. Mm. And so I think that's why crime fiction is so popular at the moment, is that we give the illusion that there is some order to the universe. And uh, uh, people who are attending the events today and seeing you, for a lot of people, it will be very much about meeting one of their literary heroes. And I wondered whether you've ever had a time in your life where you've had a chance to meet a hero of yours. This may be more music than literature, but uh, what about the maxim that you should never meet your heroes? Have you had any good or bad experiences? I've, yeah, I've had great experiences. I mean, I've, I've, I've got to meet Jagger, I've got to meet Keith Richards, I've got to meet Van Morrison, I've got to meet uh, Nick Cave, I've got to meet a lot of musicians, um, which has been fantastic because I'm a frustrated rock star at heart. Writer-wise, I mean, when I was very young and I was just writing the first Rebus novel, so before I'd ever been published, I went running up to a writer called William McIlvany at a book festival in Edinburgh and said to him, oh, I'm writing a book that's like your crime novels but set in Edinburgh and he wrote, he signed a book to me, Good Luck with the Edinburgh Laidlaw, Laidlaw being his character mm. and he probably thought I'll never see this guy again. A few years later I was published and then a few years after that I was doing events with William McIlvany and eventually when he died his widow asked me to finish his final book which I did last year. So yeah, that kind of thing is extraordinary. And I've, I've had nothing but good experiences meeting um, my heroes. One I, I do um, I regret is that I was once in London to do Desert Island Discs, mm. and my record of choice, the one record I couldn't live without, was going to be Solid Air by John Martin. I was in a restaurant and John Martin was sitting at a table outside, <laughs> and he was having a rollicking good time with several bottles of wine and some friends, and I thought, I can't, I can't walk up to him yeah. and say, hey, the reason I'm here is because of you. So I never spoke to him, uh, and I regret that. So I would say, if you get the chance, to meet your heroes whether you, you end up being disappointed or not you should always grab the nettle a fantastic note on which to end in thank you so much for your time and have a great festival thank you the next author I've managed to corner in the writers room at Cheltenham is Mallory Blackman hello Mallory hi um, I, I know that a lot of people who are coming to your event in a matter of minutes are coming because you are something of a heroic figure to them and they want to meet you and I, I know that you had an experience with an author who you looked up to right at the beginning of your career that was very important. Tell me about Alice Walker. Yes, um, it was around about my 70th rejection, that's so 65th, 70th. Anyway, um, I heard she was coming over. And so, of course, wherever she was going to be in the country, I was going to follow. Um, and she was at the Silver Moon Bookshop, which was in Charing Cross Road. So queued up for two hours, but I didn't care. I mean, it, it could have been 10 hours I would have been there. Um, finally got to the front of the queue and I said to her, uh, it's a pleasure to meet you. Please could you sign my name and could you put, don't give up? And she said, I can't write that, what does that mean? And I said, well, I really want to be a writer, but I keep getting so many rejection letters. So she looked at me and she said, don't give up. And she waved her finger at me. <laughs> and, um, and then she wrote it, so just don't give up, Alice Walker. And I, I sort of cherished the book, because it, it was her book, The Temple of My Familiar. Mm. And, uh, and then I thought, well, I can't give up now. Alice Walker's told me not to, so, <laughs> you know, so it was lovely. But that was, that was uh, w such a thrill to meet her. She was amazing. It might be, you must have gone back to the, that page and looked at it yeah. when things were getting difficult and yeah oh god yeah up. i mean it, it kind of just kept me going because i thought you know encouragement and and now when i do signings and i tell that story i have kind of would-be authors saying oh could you write don't give up so you know so we keep it fate forward but um and i'm happy to do so but i just thought you know it was just so it was the encouragement i needed at the time well, I, and in your memoir, you talk about some of the things that you have encountered through your life as a writer, the sort of the, the, the hurdles, I suppose, that yeah. you've had to get past, uh, institutional and all the rest of it. And you must be meeting young would-be writers now who still need that encouragement. Yeah, absolutely. Do you feel like we're making progress in making sure that underrepresented voices do get heard, do get published? I think we are making progress. Um, 
but there's more to be done yeah. there's always more to be done and I think we need definitely need more voices more diverse voices and we need to be more inclusive in publishing so, and we are getting there slowly but as I said I'd, I'd love to see more books from say neurodivergent authors mm -hmm. about neurodivergent characters where we're not necessarily focusing on that mm -hmm. but the characters happen to have that as part of their makeup or you know people with kind of physical and mental challenges and so forth and so all kinds of stories there's room for all kinds of stories um, so I think we just need to embrace that and I think publishers are actually beginning to wake up to that I, I mean I've seen a change in the last couple of years in terms of the books I'm being sent and set, um, and the books that are available, and and I can, and I have to say, you know, about time. <laughs> and I'm hoping, I'm hoping. I mean, having been over 30 years in this business, yeah. I've kind of seen this before, and then it fizzled out. Mm -hmm. And so I'm hoping this time it has enough momentum to kind of keep going. I hope so, because there is a definite market for the different stories, different voices, different ways of telling those stories. Yeah, and in fact, your choice of publisher I thought was quite significant, going with Murky Books. I remember when you announced that you mm. were, this memoir was coming, you looked so excited yeah. about publishing it. What is it about them that excites you as well, a publisher? Well, I just, I love the fact that they're, um, you know, they're, the commitment to kind of being inclusive and, and and broadening out the scope of kind of what's available in publishing yeah uh, and also the fact that you know Stormzy is such a lovely guy so um and the fact they asked me they said are you you know they were the ones who said are you interested in writing a memoir and I thought well actually yes I am so you know so um it all sort of came together at the right time and I just thought I I just felt now is a good time to kind of take stock and yeah just kind of write my memoir well, I will let you get on and meet all of those uh, readers who want to meet you. But Mallory, thank you so much for your time. My pleasure. So the writers' room is getting quite boisterous now, but I have managed to corner children's author Anna James. Hello. Author of the Pages and Co. series. Hello, Anna. Hello. Now, the very great thing about Cheltenham being back and events being back is sort of seeing authors connecting with readers. But you're used to connecting with very young readers with your books, so you do lots of school visits and things like that. How is that different, do you think, to sort of connecting with others? <laughs> Tell me a little bit about that. I think that it is not to besmirch adult readers, but I do think it probably has a capacity for joy and wonder that as adults we don't necessarily have much chance to access I would say as you might be able to hear it's also a great way to pick up colds uh, so there's only a certain number of schools you can visit in a, in a three week period without getting ill um, middle grade is such an amazing like age group to talk to you because they are old enough that you can really engage with them and have proper conversations with them but they are young enough that they just about still believe in magic which right. makes it a pretty special age group and do you so in a traditional author event you might expect there to be some chatter and then a sort of Q&A session towards the end do you have Q&A sessions with kids and if so what sort of questions do they ask you so I would say maybe 75% of the questions are the questions you get asked at literally every event, which is, you know, the, where do you get your ideas from, how long does it take to write a book, and then 25% of them are questions that you have never been asked before in your life and could not possibly anticipate. Although the question I get asked the most often is, do you have any owls in your books? I get asked that regularly by separate kids at separate events, and there wasn't, but there sure as heck is now, because kids love owls. <laughs> Give the people what they want. I, I am into that, yeah, and I love Owls, although I did go and do an owl experience at a falconry centre because I was like, okay, I need to put some owls in and I don't really know anything about owls. Owls aren't clever, you know, the whole like wise old owl. They're actually quite, like, they're not clever. Like, like even for birds, they're not clever. So... Are the owls in your book going to display this character? Yes, no, in oh. my new series, I actually have an owl who wants to be a wise... I shouldn't say this, actually, it's all top secret, but um, yes, I will say I've enjoyed riffing on... But I always enjoy riffing on like tropes and cliches in fantasy, but owls are now on that list too. So not a spoiler so much as a tease for what we can expect yes. from the next book. It's quite a way off though, so any authors out there, dopey owl companion, <laughs> that's mine. <laughs> <laughs> Anna, thank you so much. Thank you. And as soon as I returned to London after my trip to Cheltenham, it was time to get the microphone out once again, as Waterstones Piccadilly played host to an author with Hollywood pedigree, two-time Oscar winner Gina Davis, there to sign copies of her memoir, Dying of Politeness. 
Had she had any encounters with heroes when she was a kid? Not when I was not when I was growing up. When I was a kid, that didn't happen. The first, you know, famous person that I met was Dustin Hoffman, and uh, I mean, for a, your first uh, celebrity, that, that was really special. And I got to work with him too. You know, that was my first job. What yeah. was that on? Uh, Tootsie. Oh, I, I had a, a supporting part in Tootsie. Yeah, yeah. I love that film. Thank you. <laughs> I know, me too. <laughs> and one of the things I suppose with being an actor, working in that environment, is that. You have to not, I suppose, get starstruck when you meet people like that because you have to work with them and you have to sort of be professional. Like I that. suppose, right. But, yeah, did, yeah. but you say that, it makes me think that maybe you still have that wonder when you do get to meet some of those really famous people. Sometimes, sometimes. I'll tell you the strangest thing was I was in a post office one time and Ray Liotta was in there and there was hardly, hardly anybody else around. And I went to say hi, you know, when, People in the business meet each other, you know, it's like you're in a club and it's, you know, it's all very normal. But for some reason, I got painfully shy. I turned red, I was stammering and I was blushing. And, and he said, what? what's happening with you? Are you okay? Are you shy or something? You know, I don't know why. I just, maybe I had a big crush on him that I didn't realize until I saw him in person. Gina, I hope you have a lovely time meeting some of the readers uh, this evening. Yes. And uh, enjoy the rest of your tour. Thank you very much. And as I left the building, I saw the queue growing outside where I met people who had become fans of Gina Davis from films like Beetlejuice, Thelma and Louise and Stuart Little. And then, right at the end of the queue, I met someone for whom today was going to be doubly special. So I've come to the very end of the line here in the queue, uh, and here I have met... Nicole. Nicole, uh, you will get to meet Gina Davis yeah, this evening. You look quite excited about it. Can I you am. tell me a little bit about why you're here and what it means to be able to meet her? So, yeah, I'm originally from Germany, but I live here in the UK. And since I was a little girl, I'm a big fan of Gina Davis. So when I was about five or six years old, I um, watched um, Cutthroat Island with her as the pirate princess. And of course, when you're little, you want to be that princess, right? So uh, I've been growing up with, with all her movies, like in the 90s and noughties. And Thelma and Louise is obviously a cult. Um, but yeah, so yeah, I'm a massive fan of hers for a very long time. And it's actually my birthday today. Is it? So, Happy birthday. Thank you. So it's it's going to be definitely the best birthday present ever in my eyes at least so yeah i'm very excited meeting her oh that's fantastic well listen uh, hopefully a great birthday present for you uh, but have a lovely evening thank you i of course think you should always meet your heroes and generally see authors at live events whenever you can over the last decade or so i've learned so many fascinating things from talking with authors or from hearing them in conversation with others and when you're in the room or the hall or the tent with them in that moment you never know what they might reveal and that's the joy of being there in person i'll be continuing my conversations with authors on the podcast next year but for now all the best <laughs>